Hi, and welcome back to another episode of Visual Studio Toolbox. I'm back with my guest, Suze Hinton. Hi, Suze. Welcome to the show again. Hey, thanks for having me back. Yeah, so we're here. We're doing a series on Windows IoT core development, and Suze is back to do episode two out of that series. And what are we going to talk about today? Yeah, so today we're actually going to run our very first Windows IoT Core UWP app, which is really awesome. exciting. Uh, and it, the app that we're going to run, it blinks an LED. And an LED is just like a little light that you can plug into your breadboard. And because a lot of IoT projects don't necessarily have like a visual screen or any kind of graphics, we like to consider the blinky LED to be like the hello world of um, of like an electronics project. So normally you're printing to a console or something like that, but mm -hmm. in electronics, the blinking light means, okay, everything seems to be working. <laughs> awesome. And in the previous episode, this is episode two out of our series, you know, we talked about some of the fundamentals, right? We, right. we said, what's a breadboard? How does it all, the hardware sort of all work together? What programming language can you use? How do you build for it? So we did a lot of the conversational pieces. So totally. people should go watch that episode if they want, but here we're actually going to jump into Visual Studio, right? This is the first time and from this episode forward, it's all about you know running Visual Studio and doing something with the devices. So it's, it's exciting. Yeah, we're going to sort of prove that there's no smoke and mirrors. It really is just normal Visual Studio development. Yeah, yeah. awesome. All right, well, let's jump right into it then. Let's cool. go ahead. So I have the Microsoft Windows IoT Core Samples repository up, and this is on GitHub, and you can clone this down to get started with it. We have a lot of samples to start with. Mm -hmm. We are going to just start with the blinky one. And so when you when you have a look at the documentation, it helps you. There are really friendly links on how to get started and things like that, and actually how to use the samples themselves. Awesome. So people watching this can then go ahead. We'll put a link in the show notes. They can download this exact sample specifically and then look at other samples. Totally. So in the samples uh, directory, there's the whole list there, and we're just going to be using like Hello Blinky. So that's what we'll be using today. Uh, and then we just need to read the code, find out, mm -hmm. you know, uh, in the README where to plug in the LED and things like that. And then we're all good to go. Okay, awesome. And there's also great documentation right behind this platform. So where, where can people go for that? Yep. So you can go to docs.microsoft.com, which is where mm -hmm. all of our docs live. And we have a, an entire section on Windows IAT core um, and getting started with it. And we have a lot of really cool sections, including tutorials and things like that. Um, so usually I recommend that people click on the Get Started link, mm -hmm. and that explains exactly what it is, gives a little more detail than we gave in the last episode, um, and also gives you a list of devices that are compatible and things like that, which is really cool. So definitely check that out just to familiarize yourself with the process of getting up and running because mm -hmm. we are skipping a few of those steps today. Okay. Awesome. Yeah, and we did talk about like device compatibility being important in the last episode. So totally. definitely folks should like check that episode out if they've never done this before. And yep. uh, today we'll make it start making it real. Okay, awesome. So let's jump into the sample then. Uh, go to Visual Studio and why don't you introduce to us what we're doing here, what we're looking at. Right. So I'm just opening the main page, you know, dot uh, mm -hmm. Um And we have uh, the, the actual class with code, as you can see here. It doesn't really look particularly different from a regular UWP app. In our solution, um, you know, we have our package app manifest and, and our app.xaml and everything that you would normally uh, see. We also have our XAML file itself, which shows that we're setting up a UI as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, awesome, awesome, simple, simple little UI there to demonstrate <laughs> that it's just it's just XAML like you would expect it. And um, the only thing different for, for like regular people that have experience with WPF or UWP or anything else, XAML based like platform wise, is that we're targeting ARM on top, right? That's the one kind of totally. thing that really stands out. Everything else looks like regular code, but the, the build target, the platform we're targeting. Yeah, so when you have a look here at debug, um, this is where you'll see that normally you wouldn't see that, um, mm -hmm. but that's what we set everything up to be. And we have templates in Visual Studio, uh, which gets you started with like an app from scratch if you'd prefer not to use a sample. Mm -hmm. And it should set all of that stuff up for you too. Okay, awesome. And now you, you also have next to the run button, it says remote machine, right? Because you actually need to debug against a remote device. Uh, that's one of the things I learned and talked about in the previous episode. Like there's no emulator. You've got to like either have an ARM device. I mean, maybe that could work in the future. We are getting like ARM devices for Windows now. Mm -hmm. But let's assume you're, you're like me. You, all your devices are not ARM. Your, your Raspberry Pi, in this case, our device would be ARM, and that's our target. That's that's why you need to run and run this code to, de to debug it on the remote machine, right? So how does that even work? How does it connect to the Pi device? Yeah, so there are several ways to connect to your device. Um, and usually the most straightforward way that I recommend at the beginning mm -hmm. is to use Ethernet, because then you've got just a direct connection from your development um, laptop or your development desktop 
to the actual Raspberry Pi itself. Right. You can actually access it as long as both computers are on the same network, though. Yeah. So you don't necessarily have to be directly tethered, um, but usually I recommend that just so that it's really easy for discoverability and things like that. Yeah. And what it does is it'll build your app, and then it actually just copies that package over and it, it tells like Windows to start running that app on the on the Raspberry Pi itself. So it's literally like a one click yeah. deployment. R over run, deploy, debug scenario, right? The, the thing yeah. that people expect like on Windows as well, right? Mm -hmm. or, or back like on Windows Phone development or any other kind of remote device type of development. That, that's pretty cool. Um, and it knows which device to target based on the IP address of the device, right? Correct. That's what it's using internally. Or it, I guess you can use host name as well. I, I like IP addresses. I think that sim simplifies my life. Um, <laughs> the, the other thing that I found useful is that, you know, wh when I when I got my Pi home, the first like oh, moment like frustration I had was I actually didn't have any adapter to direct Tether. Like yes. you're using an adapter right right now right. with the laptop. Like talk talk about that device because I didn't have that. Yeah. And if you don't have that, then you need something else. And we'll, we'll talk about the regular way I did it, but how did you get it to work here? Yeah, so um, normally when I'm debugging this from home, I have like this Pi hooked like into my router, mm -hmm. and so then I can access it just through the local right. network. So, so if it's plugged in to, or, to a router over regular Ethernet, yes. it will just work because that's your home local network, your, your debug machine totally. against the network as well. Totally. And then you have this as the alternative mobile setup. For yeah, that. so this is the direct tethering. So I have a really fancy laptop, and it's a little too thin to have like an entire Ethernet port. Too thin, yeah. <laughs> and so the way that I got around that was I, I bought like a USB to Ethernet adapter, mm -hmm. um, and that works really, really well. And so I just, you know, bought mine off Amazon and it was plug and play. Mm -hmm. And so I found that that's been the easiest way for me to do it when um, I'm out and about and debugging things, even though I get strange looks when I'm trying to do this uh, at the airport yeah. or something like that. <laughs> Lots of boards. <laughs> yeah, so I tend to try and be discreet and have that all in my backpack, but then I can have this nice cable mm -hmm. here and still be developing, right. which is really convenient. Yeah, so what's your technique? Yeah, I mean, so my technique it, that, that was to get a router because I didn't have a router. <laughs> I mean, I, I literally like I, I live in an apartment where they gave me wiring in the walls out to the internet, so that was easy. Wow. Yeah, fa fancy, right? So I didn't even like I didn't even have a router. I used to have a router always in my life, except the last couple of years when I exactly started this. Thing. <laughs> so I bought a, went to, to Best Buy, bought a router, uh, and like you said, that just works great because they gave me a local network to to attach to and. Um, it, it, the Raspberry Pi can connect to wireless. Like you could connect it to your wireless. That does work, um, but that's a next level of complexity. I actually yes. like the physical connection for the beginning, and then you can configure it to work off a hotspot or whatever, but this is the first easiest way to go. Yeah, totally. And once you're actually done debugging and things, mm -hmm. you don't need to be tethered like this anymore, right? So yeah. you would actually like package up an actual release. Yeah. Um, you can then deploy it to the device. And then the device has really nice abstractions um, through like a portal that you can access to just set up what is the startup app. And then that means that every time you turn on your Pi, instead of starting up the default app, which we've been working with, it'll just start your own UWP app. So it's really, really nice once you actually do become untethered. Awesome. So let's talk about a couple of those apps. Uh, maybe we didn't plan originally to talk about them, but I think it's important, like every number again, my getting started, uh, I realized that there's this whole suite of apps that you can get from us, from Microsoft, that lets you, first of all, you can get the device working. So you, you totally. buy a micro SD card, right? You need to plug it into some laptop that's running this piece of software. Maybe you can start that, uh, that dashboard manager and show people um, what that piece of software looks like. Yes. Um, and then th that piece of software lets you just configure you know, Windows on the card. So you can actually you can, you can configure the preview version of Windows or the main one for Windows IoT Core. And then you pull that card out, you plug it into your Pi, and your Pi boots up magically. Right? Yeah. So that's kind of the, the two-step process. But I didn't realize that, like, again, I started <laughs> from scratch. I was like, how do I get this micro SD card to have Windows on it? Do I X copy it? Do I... No, there's an app. We ship an app for you, right? Yeah, it's so, so easy because I know with like general Raspberry Pi stuff, you know, you can buy SD cards with software preloaded on it. And mm -hmm. so it would be ridiculous if we asked people to have to go through all that trouble. Right. So I was really pleasantly surprised by just clicking one button with my SD card plugged in, and yeah. then it just deployed the exact copy of Windows that I needed, and then you turn the Pi on and it, and it works. So yeah. I'll, I can definitely show you that dashboard. Cool. So uh, yeah, let's take a look at it now. So if I bring up the IoT dashboard, which is the app that we just mentioned, uh, I can already see that my Raspberry Pi is plugged in. Uh, this is the IP address so that I know how to uh, connect that to Visual Studio for debugging and deployment, which is really cool. Now, I like to call my stuff like uh, with a prefix of noop or noop <laughs> because my name on the internet is noopcat, so that's why mine's called noop pi. <laughs> right. So you can name it whatever you want. and. 
and then it shows you the, the IP address and the exact OS version. So it gives you some rich information as long as it can. It can also show you like, is your Pi being detected on the, on the local network, yes. direct tether or local home internet? And this is the same app that we would also use to set up the new device, right? There's like a tab here, mm -hmm. you click on it and it's just magical. And then what I found out, uh, we don't have to show this in detail here, but like what I found out, if you sign in in the bottom left, you, and if you're a window insiders, you start seeing insider builds. It's the same thing if you oh, click that yes, blue link, sign yes. in as Windows Insider. So by having your identity, you can get internal builds. But I mean, I started and I still use actually the RTM build. I don't, I don't skip ahead. I'm not that advanced. <laughs> uh, but this thing will download it, install it, give it a name, give it a password, and then you just pull the card out, plug it into your Pi. Exactly. And if your hardware is compatible with that OS version, it works. Yeah. It's cool. really awesome. And so that's literally as easy as it is. Um, you fill out the details, you download and install. It'll tell you when you're done. And mm -hmm. then you just eject the SD card from your computer, plug it into the Pi, and then uh, you'll see the Windows icon show up on a little screen if you have it plugged in, which blew my mind. Yeah. You know, I'm not used to seeing that on like a hardware device. Yeah, yeah, it's really cool. And, and the fact that you have a screen attached over regular HDMI, that's all you needed, right? So in fact, you could hook this up to a big screen. I mean, I, I've done that, right? Like, it's just HDMI. It's yep. just Windows totally. in a big way. Um, and then you have some advanced hardware with touch and stuff you can add later. But the beginning, you can start with like, y like you can scavenge at home. Like, that's what <laughs> I did. I took my HDMI spare monitor. I plugged it into the Pi. That was my first getting it to work. Then I bought a fancy screen. Like, you don't have to buy a lot of stuff to get started. Just the board and some spare equipment a lot of us have laying mm -hmm. around. Yeah, I, cool. I feel like everyone has that old monitor lying around <laughs> yeah. that like it's too small or it's like not nice anymore because you bought a new fancy one and I find that that's like awesome for use with the Pi for sure. Yeah, and you can plug in a keyboard and a mouse into that yes. Pi and then you can control the app that you just built and deployed. So that's what I did at home. And, and I actually wound up not having a keyboard that I, I could plug in. So I did that, I had to buy a keyboard. But then I, I remembered I had a, a Bluetooth keyboard. Yes. And I found that that works with the yeah. device. So you can use Bluetooth mouse, Bluetooth keyboard regular USB mouse and keyboard, mm -hmm. it's Windows. It's kind of magical. That's, that's the one thing that I think takes this for, for Microsoft developers um, kind of to the next level of ease. It's so started. true. Yeah, a lot of the drivers that you would kind of be expecting to be on like regular Windows mm -hmm. are, are there because it's really just a, an, an optimized version of Windows 10, which is great. Yeah, that's awesome. awesome. All right, so let's go back to Visual Studio and maybe sure. take a look on uh, kind of how do you start, how do you, how do you like run code against the device, how does the configuration for the IP address look, that sort of thing, I think it'd be interesting to show people. Yeah, absolutely. So you do have to do a little bit of work to kind of set up this remote machine. Uh, and it's, it should be in your regular debug settings. And so if you go in, you should see this thing right here that says Blinky mm -hmm. Properties. Um, and so I'm going to go back into that. Yeah. It works the same if you right click on your, on your uh, project in oh, the, on the right hand. Solutions for, yeah, it goes yeah. right in. So it's under the debug tab. I feel like I feel like you're like the power user of Visual Studio. And <laughs> so many years <laughs> back back from the days before it was called Visual Studio. So yes, I have an advantage. Awesome. So you can see um, there there are a lot of different options. You don't necessarily need to have to worry about all of them. The most mm -hmm. important part here is in the start options in the middle here. So you can see the target device is needs to be set to remote machine. Mm -hmm. The remote machine itself, um, the IP address is definitely like the best way to go about yeah, this. Easiest. And you can grab that IP address directly from the, the IoT dashboard yeah. that we showed earlier it as well. It makes it easy. And also on the Pi itself, you can also see uh, the IP address if you have a screen yes. attached. So that's yeah, and too. that's really nice. So there is a default app that starts on the Pi mm -hmm. that gives you extra uh, additional information about that. So that should be all that you need to get up and running. And um, a lot of the time, you know, this stuff is already um, part of the template. Mm -hmm. So usually you only need to fill in the remote machine details and then you're good to go. Okay. What else can we talk about? All right. So what do we show it actually like hitting a breakpoint? I think that's always yes. a great part. So we have it set to ARM, so we know it's going to build to the right platform. Mm -hmm. We already configured the IP address, so we did that. And there really wasn't much else you probably had to do that kind of as the default, as long right. as the device can be seen. So now we just hit F5, right? Yeah, this Let's is scary. It. But yeah, so. so <laughs> always <laughs> scary. F5 is always scary. <laughs> yeah, so we set a breakpoint pretty early on in the um, in the app. And I'm, I'm happy to mm -hmm. explain how the, the code works later on. But um, it should hit this point, and it should do that remotely. So. You, you normally would be expecting that it's coming from the emulator or mm -hmm. from your actual desktop, but you're actually going to start seeing details that are specific to the Pi, including you know, all of the, the monitoring and things like that. Mm -hmm. So if I hit F5 now, we should actually start seeing that building. Right, so it's very, very standard stuff, you know, Windows. Mm -hmm. um, 
with those developers will be familiar with it, right? You've got your output, it's showing the build happening, mm -hmm. it's going to do the deployment. I think you showed me a tip earlier, it's actually going to show you the path in there of where on the Pi it's deploying yeah. it to. I, I've, I learned something new, that was, <laughs> that was cool. It's very cool. So this is normal, right? This yeah. is what you would normally see. Totally normal. You got uh, your diagnostics, your outputs, your locals, everything you would expect as a C Sharp developer. Yeah, and so this is actually showing you all of these kind of um, these metrics mm -hmm. and the diagnostics are actually for the Pi. So it's not for your laptop. Um, and then if you look in the output, it's it's actually showing this is not my my laptop's like path at all. Mm -hmm. And so this is this is the default user account on the Pi where it's actually deploying the app and running Blinky.exe, which is really really cool. Yeah. That's awesome. And uh, so basically you're running the app, so like, like yep. let's run the app, let's see what it actually looks like on the device. Yeah, so we started running it and it did actually halt at this breakpoint right here. And so this looks as it normally would, mm -hmm. um, which is really cool. And so let's say like the GPIO, which is our general purpose input output, mm -hmm. um, this, is, this absolutely needs to be started up for us to even be able to like start manipulating things on the breadboard, right? Mm -hmm. Because that's what our um, devices are plugged into. And so I can just regularly roll over my variables just to make sure that they did actually um, instantiate properly, which is really, really cool. Mm -hmm. um, and then we can just keep continuing so that the app keeps running. And you'll, s you'll see again that the diagnostics then can c continue. Yep. And the apps actually started up. So let's let's go over and see what is actually happening on the screen yeah. and what's happening on the breadboard. So this app is called Blinky, yeah. which sort of gives away what it should be doing. Yeah, let's and zoom into the hardware here on the screen. Yeah, so if we take a look over here at the hardware, we have our screen, uh, which has a, a very, very attractive, um, it has a very attractive app running. I know that if uh, I was friends with a designer, I'd actually be able to do a better job at this. Yeah. <laughs> no, this is the sample. I mean, we're yeah, showing so people what the they're going to see. Right. And so that uh, red and white sort of cycling um, circle there is just an indicator that it is telling the LED to turn on and off. And so that's just a visual reproduction of the 500 millisecond rate that we're doing that at. And then if we come over and have a look at the breadboard, we do have some pretty bright lights here, but you should be able to see that there's a tiny little blue light and it is turning off and on. And it's actually doing that in sync with our UI as well, which is kind of reflecting that too. That's awesome. And so yeah. that's that's all the app does. Uh, it starts up the GPIO so that it can then start um, toggling that LED. And that's how Hello World. Awesome. So cool. how does it, like the breadboard has a bunch of places you can plug stuff into, right? So people mm -hmm. might buy a kit that has a blinking light and it has some transistors and some wires and they might follow the instructions we lay out, right, to plug it all in. But then when you're looking at the code, how do you relate the code knowing where you've plugged something in and you send the command? Maybe you can jump into that C Sharp and show people. Yeah, that's a really, really good question. Um, and just to, just to put the breadboard up in probably a slightly more accessible manner too before we begin. Um, we, we do tend to create these diagrams with our samples that show you how to plug everything in. Uh, and so this here is the actual circuit that we're using. If my computer wants to start up, yep. yep. Um, and so this is, this is a good wiring diagram because it shows you exactly where you need to plug what. The wire um, colors don't actually matter at all, but it is helpful to have like the right resistor, for example, here. Yeah. And, and, and you have like col columns and rows identified by letters and numbers, right? So people totally. can, like I've missed that because it's gray, it's a little bit weak, and it's on the physical board, it's on this diagram, but that's how you know where they're telling you to plug it in, so it's like a mystery. And yes. again, once you learn about more about how hardware works, this will be less demystified. But when you're first starting, this is terrifying. <laughs> you're like, where do I plug it in? How do I, do I plug in both the, the, the little wires in totally. there? Yes, this shows you exactly the exact spot. So follow it 100% and you'll be exactly. good to go. Exactly. Yeah, so if, you know, once you get comfortable, you'll be like, well, I don't want to put the LED on the left side of the breadboard. I want to put it on the right. And so yeah. you'll get more confident with, like, understanding how it works and everything. But we try and make it super easy by giving you um, just, like, a, a very visual way of being able to follow that. Yeah, very reproducible. And, and yes. where, where did you get the the hardware for this, like the breadboard and the like the the Raspberry Pi doesn't come with it by default, right? You have to you, you have to buy some of this stuff. Some of them are kits and. Yep, that's right. Um, so I got 
mine as part of this kit here. Mm -hmm. So this is the Microsoft IoT pack for Raspberry Pi 3. Um, awesome. It is a collaboration that we had with Adafruit. Adafruit is mm -hmm. one of my favorite companies uh, in the world. And they're also New York based. So I'm from New York. A little so bit biased, yes. Yeah, I want to support local business. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> and so we've done some really, really cool Azure IoT collaborations with Adafruit. And this mm -hmm. is probably one of my favorite packs. So this is the Microsoft IoT pack for Raspberry Pi. You can actually choose to have one, uh, the Raspberry Pi come with it. Mm -hmm. But if you already have a Raspberry Pi, Pi lying around and you've just shamefully never done anything with it and and this is feels like your time to do so you can also just buy the pack alone mm -hmm. it does come with some really cool um, really really cool um, like devices and bits and pieces that you can plug in, including one of the sensors that we're going to be using in this series. Awesome. Uh, and that comes with the breadboard and everything that you need to get started with. So you don't need to hunt down anything. If you're comfortable buying an entire pack, then this is definitely the way to go. OK, awesome. Yeah, that I think demystifies some of it. So let's go take a look at the code and see how does the code know what to do? How does the code know which part of that board to actually interact with? Totally. To Totally. So I'm actually just going to stop this program mm -hmm. just so that we're not distracted by everything, all yeah. the diagnostics. So we have just our, our normal class where we're defining a lot of the variables that we're going to be using. Um, and you'll see that there's a curious one here, which is an integer. And the constant is called LED pin. Mm -hmm. So does that give you any clues as to like what you think I it'll think be? I think it does. Yeah, I think that's how we know where it's plugged in, right? Where we're going to send the command. Exactly. And so we see this integer 5. And that's our clue uh, if we weren't like following that nice breadboard picture. If mm -hmm. let's say like someone just gave you a random app and you had no instructions, these are the kind of clues that you need to look for when it comes to hardware as to where you might need to plug that into. Can we show on the board like how we correlate that number 5 to the actual board 5? Yes, absolutely. If, if, if maybe the camera can zoom in back to the board, we can show people like what that looks like. Because to me, this was very mysterious. Like, let's bring it up to the full screen because this is hard to see a little bit. And yep. like, how do you know it's five on here? Yeah, so normally you would, um, well, you, c you don't have to use this particular breakout that I'm using here. You can plug stuff directly into mm -hmm. the Raspberry Pi's GPIO, which sounds mm -hmm. like that was the way that you've been yeah. doing and things. And when we say GPIO, we mean, we mean the pins on the Pi that are currently blocked yes. by the fact that we plugged that big cable in, yeah. right? So that's the GPIO cable. Like, to me, none of this was obvious when I was trying. I was like, what's a GPIO cable? What's a GPIO port? Oh, my Pi has a GPIO thing. Yes, that's what it is. And mm -hmm. we're just enabling the breadboard to be its extension now, but giving you more, right. more pluggable things. And we have this number five, so how does that correlate? Yep, totally. So the 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 row, the, there's like a double row of pins going along the side of the Raspberry Pi. And mm -hmm. then if you use this breakout, which sometimes is called a cobbler, because Pi, cobbler, get sure. it? Yeah. <laughs> it's really cool. Um, this just allows me to work directly on the breadboard, and I don't have to keep crossing back between the Pi and the breadboard. But every single one of the, um, the GPIO pins on the Raspberry Pi has been broken out and labeled on this breakout board here. And so um, you can see there's, there should be a bunch of numbers that are running all along each one so that you can easily f just look for the number five. And that's where we need to plug it in. Mm -hmm. And so it's very small for you to see here, but I do have the red a wire plugged in, and because remember these copper lines kind of go vertical, uh, I can just pop one in uh, at one of the locations that you know is right across from pin five, where the where it's labeled, and that's really all there is to mm -hmm. it. That's how you plug it in. And how do you know to plug in the other wire you have there? Because you have a black wire, uh, which is the ground, yes. I believe. That's something I've learned. <laughs> Again, I, I know nothing about electronics. Like literally, I'm right. very newbie. So I'm like, why do we need a ground cable? And how do we know where which one of these to plug it in? And I and I and tell me if I'm wrong or right, but I remember I think reading that certain pins are designated as ground, and that's just why that's the one that works. Yep. There's multiple of them. Mm -hmm. And the diagram you had before shows you which one you can use, but you can use any ground for the black, and the red has to go to match the number in the constant in the app. Totally, yeah. So it's really right. good to explain this. So there are, uh, there does tend to be like multiple grounds on a lot of boards, such as the Raspberry Pi or the Arduino, mm -hmm. and that's mostly just for convenience. Especially if you don't have a breadboard, you can kind of have multiple devices plugged into ground because it is kind of like the common default for every device to use. Right. And so by plugging things into grounds, we're actually giving, we're closing the circuit to actually give the electricity like a path to run across. Mm -hmm. So if we sent power to this LED and we didn't have a ground, then nothing would actually move because there's no motivation for our, yeah. our circuit to actually like start being powered. Yeah. And so that's why we always need a ground. 
And you can think about pin five as like a remote controllable power source, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. And so yeah. you can either say that pin is sending, uh, the pin five is sending power, or you can say it's not sending power. And that's what completes or doesn't complete that circuit. Right, and then if, from the wires you have set up there, you, you sort of translate that five into a different spot, which matches where the light is, and that's how the light turns on. Exactly. And you match it for the light in the right places. So that's kind of, like it's all black magic until you realize <laughs> that the wire, the wire on the breadboard from one place to another connects that five on ground to where the light is. Exactly. And therefore the light could have been somewhere else, like you said, right? There's this, you, once you get more advanced, you can move the light around and stuff. But like, if you follow this configuration, it will work. It will get the light on, you'll get the basics and then this code will actually run. And if you connect it to six instead of five, you can just change that constant and that's fine. And you can change where the ground is connected as long as that's a ground location. You can't connect ground to power. Yeah. I've heard people even breaking some of their like yes. devices and stuff. So it's really scary. Yeah. So you have to be <laughs> careful. Like I, I tell people, uh, new, pe new people to Windows IoT, the one thing to remember is you are getting to the, like, that level of power not to over, over you use the word power, <laughs> power, everything's power. The yeah. power of power, but the power of power is it can break stuff. Absolutely. Uh, plug stuff in the right place, double check that, um, make sure before you send power to it. In other words, like if your pie is unplugged and your, board, your, your board's connected, your breadboard into the pie, it doesn't have magical power source of any kind. So it's kind of safe, you can move things around. Once you plug that pie mm -hmm. in, you can break something. Totally. Make sure you plug in correctly. Yeah, and I'm really cautious. Like I get worried that I'm just gonna like accidentally touch a wire to a contact accidentally because I drop it on the pie or something. So I tend to always unplug stuff when I'm moving things around on the breadboard. Like it takes like two seconds to plug it back in again. But I, I really like what you said about double checking everything, like the measure twice, cut once kind of thing. I feel like that does actually give you a lot of safety in electronics. Um, and the LED even, it has a ground wire and it has a, a, a like a power wire. Mm -hmm. And so if you get them mucked around the wrong way, it doesn't, in this case, it doesn't matter too much, but you'll find that your circuit won't actually work because it's not in the right orientation. Got it. So, so ask me how I know that you can burn something out. Oh yeah, what's your story? Because I burned something out. Yes. I, just, I just plugged stuff in the wrong places <laughs> and I plugged power and that thing stopped working forever. But did you feel like less afraid after that? Because you're like, okay, I, I, I messed it up. That's out of the way now. That's kind of how I felt, but also kind of stupid. But yeah. that's okay. <laughs> that's okay. That's why we're here. We're, we're trying to help folks not, not to make yeah. the mistakes. And if you do, these, these things aren't that expensive. Right. You, you go, maybe hurts a little more than your, your <laughs> wallet, depending on situations, but like it's not so bad. Um, I've heard people burning their boards out. I've heard people totally. doing all sorts of stuff. So I think probably the one thing, it's kind of safe-ish, yeah, it's not a legal statement, um, <laughs> is your computer. I don't think you can break your computer necessarily. You're plugging over Ethernet and stuff like that. But from the board out, it's you've got to know what you're doing. So yeah. just be careful. Um, maybe we can end by looking at, at the code itself. So we, we, we know sure. where to send it. And we have this ma magical class for now. People don't have to get the full understanding of it. But the GPIO pin and value, all of that is part of this like, that black wires magic into the board <laughs> and into the spot. Yes. That's good enough. So there's a class that we provide as, as a Windows IoT platform. Yep. And then how do we how do we tell it to start blinking? Yeah, so we just we can just use windows.devices.gpio. It's ridiculously easy to just include that and start using it. Uh, and so we need to define a, a the actual pin int that it's going to be on. We create a pin uh, and then we can also like create a pin value to be able to actually set it. So that's sort of how we turn it on and off. Mm -hmm. And the easiest thing for us to do is to just set up a timer so that you know every 500 milliseconds that actually runs that handler that we attach to it. Mm -hmm. And so after initializing our GPIO, which just means that we're opening our pin at pin five, um, and then we set the pin value to be high. And high means we're sending power to it. Low mm. means we're not sending power to it. So it's a very binary thing. So it's pretty easy to get your head around. Um, and then, you know, every, every time we actually want to start writing that value to the pin, that's where we can use our pin API and mm -hmm. pin.write. Okay, so pin.write writes the value. Mm -hmm. And um, the value is that high value and the pin, has been open to five, so it already knows where to send that high value to. Yep. And then you have that one more command, said drive mode. What is said drive mode? Yeah, so that's a really good point. So when we talk about like the um, abbreviation GPIO, it's mm -hmm. general purpose input output, right? Mm -hmm. So um, you know most of the pins can be either an input or an output. So you can either read to it 
or uh, mm -hmm. read from it or you can write to it. Uh, and okay. so in this case, we're saying like we want uh, pin 5 that we're setting up, we want this pin to actually be an output. So we are actually right. like writing a value to it or sending power to it. Right. So with, with this magical combination, it just is going to start writing. <laughs> it just works, yeah. yeah. Um, and working with these pins um, tends to be, um, you know, kind of like the basic foundation to learn. And from mm -hmm. there, you can kind of move up to like communication protocols and things like that. Awesome. And so our handler, which is our timer tick, um, is what takes care of doing um, the actual blinking itself. And so this conditional will seem super familiar to you. Um, you know, we're checking to see if the you know, the current pin value is already set to high. If it is, then we want to set it low, right? Mm -hmm. So if the light is on, we want to turn it off. Um, and so we then uh, create a new pin value and write directly to that pin five. And then we fill the, um, the little kind of circle, the LED yeah. indicator on our UI with red. And yeah. then if it's actually like already uh, off, then we want to turn it on and then we want to kind of update the UI accordingly as well. So that's pretty, um, that's pretty straightforward to get your head around. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you can start messing with the values and messing with the, the timer um, interval and making it blink really fast or really slow. And that's sort of how you can sort of start getting to know some of these APIs. OK, awesome. Uh, do we want to show anything else in this episode? Uh, I think that was it. I think I think the the best thing is that you know you can remotely debug this. Um, so if if your GPIO doesn't start up, for example, you can just like kind of actually walk through and maybe see why that's happening. Mm -hmm. You don't get that with most hardware. Like remote debugging is is such a treat to have. Yeah. And so I just encourage people to set breakpoints and actually step through and actually watch how things are being like set up when the app starts running. Okay, well, awesome, Suze. Well, thank you so much for being on and showing us this, you know, next step of complexity people to get through. And folks, we hope you, you enjoyed this episode. We'll have more of these episodes in the series on Windows IT development. And Suze, thank you so much for being in Visual Studio Toolbox. Hope to see you again. Yeah, thanks for having me. Let's have uh, even more fun next time. Definitely. Cool. All right, folks, thank you very much. See you next time. Bye-bye.